Well, thank you for joining and taking time out of your day to find out about the secrets and features of our software to find failover. So here's a question for you. Is your name in the news? I received this article while preparing this presentation just a few days ago, and it shows a very uh, a public response to when the network and IT is not reliable. Lost revenues, lost customers, getting in front of parliament to explain yourself and then ultimately out of a job. And the point is, is that we live in a give it to me now economy and the network is really playing catch up. With the move from twisted pair and lease lines to IP addresses, we noticed a big market gap in how devices are reliably connected end to end. And reliable remote IoT and M2M -M networking really requires more than a simple VPN to work. Here's our captive one sentence description of what IPTL does. And of course, the first part of this, the most reliable part, is what we're going to get into today. Quick note about who IPTL is. We are the actual designers, manufacturer of the appliances. We design it, we build it, we ship it. It's our stuff, our source code. We also have many patents on our innovations and more coming out as well. We've also been a very global centric company from day one. And this is really great because it allows us to take industry knowledge from all over and incorporate that into our system. There are three direct benefits when using IPTL for connectivity. Reliable links, security of your data in motion, and direct and tangible economic, economic benefits when using IPTL. You save money by using us. And one of the more interesting pieces is that we actually work with any IP link, including dynamic IP, on both ends of the link. So now you may ask, where does IPTL fit into the network? Well, we're a symmetric solution, both ends of the link. There's going to be an IPTL instance, whether it's physical to physical or physical to cloud or cloud to cloud. There's going to be an instance of IPTL software somewhere. And this is the only way you can actually really control what's going on. We can integrate any device that's got a wired or wireless Ethernet. Of course, we do some serial and some USB and some other interfaces. We're very comfortable in the IP Ethernet space. But we also support non-IP protocols, including SCADA systems, for example, or multicast, or IPv6 and IPv4 at the same time on the same link without translation. And you can see from this diagram here, we already have hints to redundancy with, with multiple tunnel links or cellular failover, or even on the server side, having redundant servers and uh, uh, on more one, uh, more one or more redundant LANs. But we're going to get all into that detail here in a minute. We're very proud of our social proof. We do what we say we do, and those that know us know our support is superior. And you don't have to believe me, you can read what some of these guys say. Also, notice we're used really across a wide range of market applications, from VoIP and UC to access control, public safety, energy, financial, health care, and more. So there's a lot of noise in the market about IoT, and I just wanted to take a moment to explain really what are we trying to fix here. And so out of all the marketing noise, it really comes down to one thing, a fixed application device and getting that networked correctly and reliably. All right? And so a fixed application device is interesting because it is what it is, right? An IP phone is what you get from the manufacturer or an access reader is the way it is is all you can do is configure it and that's it you can't change the stack you can't add an application you can't add a client it is what it is and one of the interesting things that we found with these fixed application devices is that they're actually all designed with a expectation of being on the LAN on the Ethernet network and you figure out why is that well the developers got his developer station and then right next to him on his desk is the product or the app that he's working on and it's connected by what Ethernet so it works really great on his desk and then when you start trying to remote that over constrained networks that are blocked filtered lossy doesn't work quite as well 
and it's become hard, but it's actually become harder. And many reasons is that the market really hasn't kept up. Vendors are pushing their favorite solution of the day, or you simply get that, and this is the way we've always done it. But here's what's really happening. One, stuff expects to be online all the time. Just try opening your Outlook email client when you're not online, and watch that grind to a halt. And the network is everywhere. We actually say the network has left the building. This is mobility, branches, everything is now getting an ethernet port on it. Your refrigerator or even your car like a Tesla is all network enabled. And this is one of the challenges because you can't put an app on any of those devices. And we actually see now also what we see is called connectivity actually breaks your networking. Pesky little things like dynamic IP, NATs, and firewalls all make this really impossible. Some places, traditional VPNs are just flat blocked. That's it. And it's not just state-sponsored filtering either. ISPs, network providers are notorious for network black holes, and there is no way you're going to get them to admit it, much less fix it. And then you've got the whole physical to virtual transition, the great lift and shift of office computing into the cloud. But it misses a step. One of the phrases I always use is, there, there's no printers in the cloud. What does that mean? It means, yeah, we can put our processing and our application into the cloud, no problem. And it'll work great. And the workload will run and everything's great. But it's not useful. How do you get that workload out so that your payroll program can print the checks, right? Nobody's going to take a virtual check in the cloud. You actually have to get something that's actually hard. This, this means that workers and employees and users of this network they have to be productive, and you have to give them those connectivity options. So now on to the good stuff, why we are the most reliable. So when we talk about reliable networking, communications continuity, we know what that means. We actually don't really get it a lot, or we're pretty disappointed. And the problem is, is that there's just a focus on one part of the network. Maybe it's just the client, or maybe it's just the server, double up units, you know, in case a fan goes bad or a power supply goes bad. But what you have to actually do is look at the whole network, end to end. Also, failure detection, when you actually fail over, is actually really rotten. Some solutions out there just really only support a failover detection by sending a few pings at a server, and, you know, if it doesn't work, then that's a failover condition. And that's it. But what, but what do you do when you're running a production network and you have things like multiple routes, multiple routers, VLANs, IP subnets, changing IP and provider addressing? How do you manage all of that when you go into a failover situation and then put it back when, you're back when everything's back to the way it's supposed to be? We've had many customers who came to us after they've had a problem. And the scenario goes like this. Disaster recovery kicked in. Data was faithfully secure and replicated. But nobody could get to where the replicated data was. All of the routes and all of the connectivity that the users had, remember those people that actually have to be productive? Their systems were all pointing to the down system. They couldn't actually click over to where the redundant backup was. So yeah, the data was fine. Nobody could use it. Well, what good is failover? It doesn't actually keep you running and being productive. Now, I generally don't come at competitors directly because we all have strengths, and usually the contrast of my solution is strikingly positive, but I had to show this. Um, and by the way, this gateway is actually marketed as an IoT uh, gateway uh, for failover, and I was reading up on it because I wanted to see what do they do for failover, and I pulled this right out of their own user guide, they say, for failover, hook us up to a box that does failover. Now, this is pretty typical of the industry. Push it off to the side. Yeah, we support it. It's a checkbox item. Who cares? But yeah, we'll let somebody else deal with it. We'll push it over there. Well, that increases costs, complexity, and you probably end up don't really get the network availability you were looking for anyways. And by the way, telling the IT manager, let somebody else deal with it, look on her face. She's not a happy camper. And we all know that an unhappy IT manager, everybody's unhappy. So with the, with the IPTL Fastlane appliances, we actually deliver on this promise by eliminating any single point of failure 
throughout the entire network path. We pull together and tightly integrate local remote networking, advanced failure and restore event management and triggers, um, and also advanced tunneling to ensure that full end-to-end -end path. And if you don't do all these three things, you really can't overcome the challenge. So here's how we do it. We have 10 features that are exclusive to IPTL. They're all part of our intellectual property and ensure that we can deliver on the promise of reliable communications with full path availability. Now the neat thing is, is you can use as many or as few as you need. And we can layer these on to meet the different levels of protection that your business strategy requires and your risk management requires. This means that you're not paying for expensive equipment and complex configurations you don't need. So we have things like using TLS in our black noise data whitener to hide traffic fingerprints. We do multi-tunnel bonding and failover. We have our system monitor feature, which does flow switching and dynamic network integration. It gives you some of the active-active and active-passive options. Now, sometimes people will say, Scott, I can just put in a Cisco, SonicWall, Fire, uh, Juniper, Fortinet, Microtik, you know, pick your favorite brand. And what I usually tell them is say, okay, ask these two questions. How do they guarantee full path reliable connectivity? How do they prevent a tunnel from being filtered? And usually you'll get a blank stare. The answer is they can't. And then they'll tell you, well, if you put an MPLS lease line link in, then you're going to get, well, that increases costs, complexity, and is absolutely a non-starter. But you can see now our IT manager is happy, and that means everyone is happy. Does all this actually matter? Does it work in real life? Well, yeah, it does. Here's a real live customer deployment. It's got multi-hardware protection, multi-tunnel, multi-site protection. It's got tunnel obfuscation, um, country X uh, that are, the remotes are in. They have extreme filtering. No IPsec, no L2, no GRE, no PPTP, no SSL will work through there. That's it. And by using our features, we're able to make a constant reliable tunnel so that they can go do and be productive. Now we'll get more onto this later. So you have the basic network. You got something on the left, the client, you got the server, and then you've got the network path in the middle. And this picture is deceptively simple. You know, what could go wrong? Well, most of the time nothing goes wrong. But when it does, you're dead. Sales can't happen, your boss is calling you at two in the morning, everything stops, you end up on the front page of a computing blog, you lose your job, you see how this goes. So let's break this down into specifics of what you really need to do. So after breaking down the speeds and fees, you realize that it comes down to two really important points. For full path reliability, you have to have both data and tunnel integrated with each other. Other solutions just ignore this. They pick one piece of it or they do an incomplete job. It's not enough to have a working next hop, but you have to have the tunnel and the full connectivity as part of your failover scheme. And further, you need dynamic network configuration so that in the event that there is a trigger, your apps can stay connected to your data center and processing. That's the whole point. So at this point, let me introduce to you our system monitor um, data path connectivity feature. So our system monitor feature is the brain of our data path and tunnel failover. It's exclusive to IPTL. Um, and it's standard in every IPTL appliance. There's no recurring feature license. If you've got the latest firmware version, it's under the flex path. And it provides the networking intelligence to ensure your connectivity. So if you're running split tunning and the path to the server is unreachable, your office can still get to the internet. Or if your cable modem internet goes down and the cellular clicks over automatically, everything stays up and running. So let's look at our system monitor in detail here. So with System Monitor, you can build multiple network tests, and then when those tests happen, they can trigger multiple action profiles. We, of course, we have extensive logging. You can do email alerts. Most importantly, though, you can have a variety of test types. So a lot of guys just do a ping or a DNS check. Well, of course, we can do a ping. We also allow you to do a web check. Go check a website. 
Uh, we also incorporate checking tunnels as well in all of that. And pretty important because in some places, pings are filtered, right? They will block a ping. Uh, so if you can't get a ping through end to end, how are you going to actually implement your failover? You can't. Um, and so we also have a couple things, these pass profiles. We have this clear profile that allows you to uh, reset the network every time a transition happens. And also, we can actually define very precisely who you're checking and where you're checking. And you can add up to 20 of these, prof these tests up into your system. So you can have multiple tunnels going to multiple locations with multiple tests and have everything protected. Now, I said this was a non-technical presentation, but I didn't say there wouldn't be some math involved. The most important part of System Monitor is the event detection. This is the trigger, what makes it tick, and is fully user-tunable. It enables you to precisely adjust the pass-fail criteria to match your networking situation. So let me explain. We've got test interval, test period, criteria for pass, criteria for fail. So the test interval is how many times does the, does the appliance go out and probe to check to see if the network is up or down. That test period is the overall time for checking. So here it's 20 seconds. And then in that period, we're going to evaluate how many packets we received and how many packets we lost, and then make a decision based on those percentages of whether to trigger a profile based on the pass or fail criteria. And what this allows you to do is really tune the device. If you want really fast failover, sub 10 second failover, um, you can tune this to allow that. Or if you've got a network link, let's say it's a satellite or ADSL link that is got a lot of loss on it, then you can adjust these parameters to allow for a certain level of normal data loss without triggering a failover. But when you exceed that point, then you can go into the failover mode. And by the way, these numbers on here actually account for 40% packet loss, which is actually pretty bad. Now, one of the issues with failover that makes it unusable is a condition called flapping. It's links bouncing up and down so that actually no data goes through. And it actually can be very, very frustrating. And with our system, you can actually con contune the width of that control band to prevent flapping. So in this example, you can see now we have a test every second. The evaluation period is every 10 seconds with a 60, 90 uh, fail pass uh, ratio. And you can see here that the, uh, the system really stays stable um, in the pass, goes through up here, and then we start losing some packets. It still stays in the pass condition, so you're going to get some packet loss, and then it clicks over to the failure mode and stays in there even as the link degrades. And even as the link gets better, it stays in that fail mode until you're absolutely sure you have a solid link back up. And then it clicks back over into the pass mode. And so this keeps you from bouncing up and down and keeps the link up and running and keeps you productive at the end of the day. So here's an example of the profiles now. So we just talked about the tests. Here are the actual profiles and different triggers. And so you can see the pass, fail, clear. So the clear profile actually resets all of your parameters, and then you can apply a pass or fail profile. So here, we remove everything. And then if we were to go into a pass profile, we would add, let's say in this case, VLAN 200 with this IP address. If went into a fail condition, we would run the clear profile tear all that out, and then reapply the networking for the fail profile. So let's say you're going to a different data center with different networking. You notice that the VLANs are different, the IP addressing is different. Your users would still stay online. They would still be able to reach the far end, even though the intermediate infrastructure completely changed. Now, if you look on the right-hand side, you can see a drop-down of the profiles, a very robust set of actions you can take. Add routes, delete routes, VLANs, NAT rules, send an email alerts or traps, turn on the 4G for failover, uh, turn on tunnels, etc. These give you the tools to be able to actually keep the link up in any condition. So, this is one of my competitors. It just does ping. Actually, to give them credit, they actually can do a DNS check. But if you notice, the lowest it can go is 30 seconds. So you could have 30 seconds of downtime 
just can be completely out before the failover kicks in. And also, it's a single address. You can't layer multiple addresses. And they're suggesting, yeah, just ping Google. Well, okay, that's great. That will tell me internet's working, but that doesn't necessarily mean I can reach my servers in the cloud. And um, so I'm gonna show you an example here of a real life customer, what they did. So on the left-hand side here, this is a customer using access control. They go from a hardware physical cellular unit, IPTL cellular unit, to a virtual appliance in an Amazon cloud where they have their actual access control apps running. And if you notice here, their next hop is actually trying to talk to the server and the actual application. So they don't care whether they have internet, you know, the access control reader isn't surfing the internet or watching YouTube. It's trying to send data to the application to say, is this user allowed into the building or not? And so what matters to them is, can I talk to that server? If I can't talk to that server, then I gotta find another way to talk to that server. And that's what we're allowed to set up here. And you can see, you've got different uh, pass fail uh, states that happen here based on the percentage of packets. And they set this up and this is what they're happy with. And, and you can see the current stats on that. And this meets their needs that the, the building internet that they get is good enough. But if it actually gets bad, hey, we're gonna flip over and, and talk cellular and keep everything up and running. Now, if you wanna see a really fast uh, transition, um, I've got this live demo on YouTube at this URL here. Uh, it just shows a demonstration. I um, basically unplug the ethernet there and it fails over to another server over uh, 4G. Uh, and it actually shows you an extremely quick failover and even faster restore. Um, and these things matter because now your users will see a blip or your application will see a blip and continue to working instead of timing out and failing and causing somebody to have to go back and restart their work again. So in fact, we can fail over and restore any uplink that we have connected to us. You can do fail over to Wi-Fi. So you can use our box that has Wi-Fi in it as a client um, to a local internet and fail over to that. You can fail over to multiple ISPs. You can fail over to LTE, which is one of the more popular uh, applications. Or you can fail over to all of it. Um, we have one uh, proposal out right now. It's for a uh, health company and uh, alarming system and they they have three different independent networks for failover and so if the first one goes down it's got to go to the second and if the second goes down it goes down to cellular um, and that's the level of access that they absolutely want to make sure that they have and we can support that all with our standard equipment so now that we have the data path under control let's talk about the tunnel in transit and it turns out the big things you need to do is to make it all work really well is to really protect the tunnel. Keep it from blocks, whether they're on purpose or not. Changing network conditions, whether they're on purpose or not. In some places, there's active filtering control, but also we just know that a lot of ISPs don't talk to each other correctly. So we have several tools in our toolbox here to protect the actual tunnel. We've got this TLS auth, which is also a security option. We've got black noise uh, data whitening, which actually hides the fingerprint of the tunnel so that you can't sniff that. Also for some of the more difficult installations, we have a feature called Flow Compander, which actually allows you to put a high water mark on bandwidth on a tunnel so it doesn't exceed that level, or actually expand and automatically compress packets. And the reason we do this is to get around a thing called traffic analysis. So you can't see inside the encrypted tunnel, but if you're running VoIP, for example, you can see that there's a lot of small packets happening, and you can kind of guess that it's VoIP. Well, with the Flow Compander feature, we can actually expand those packets so they're not small, and then when they get to the other side, bring them down to the right size and pass them off. Now, in most countries, VoIP and UC is legal between offices. But the problem you have is that the filters can't distinguish between legal and illegal traffic. So they just block everything, right? They, the filter can't dif differentiate between a Skype call and an IP camera at a bank branch. And so we put these tools in here to uh, enable everything to work even though there may be some uh, obstructions in the network path and this is why that matters. 
So now that we have the data path and tunnel stabilized, let's look at our tunnel failover protection options. And we have a full set of standard capabilities from a single appliance multi-tunnel to full up multi-client, multi-tunnel, multi-server set, server setups. One neat thing you can do is you can have multiple ISPs and have different tunnels over those ISPs and aggregate the tunnel bandwidth. So you get not only load sharing and additional bandwidth, but then you also get failover uh, as part of that. And this is great for those installations that may have ADSL, for example, where they don't have a high upstream bandwidth, but you want to pull those together. Again, we can eliminate any single point of failure anywhere in the network. So let's talk about the most basic failover scenario. And this is standard in the product. You don't even have to set up system monitor to do this. We've got four areas. You put in up to four different servers with four different ports and protocol types. And if one goes down, it'll just fail over to the next. Um, it does sequential or round robin. You can uh, uh, adjust it the way that works. Pretty basic, no frills, but it allows you to immediately get up there with you know literally 10 seconds of configuration. Now, usually when we talk about redundancy and failover network protection, you tend to tend to discuss things like, oh, I need to protect against a bad power supply or a CPU. But if you notice here on the server side here, we've got two servers with two different uplinks going to two different network switches. Now, if you're really doing data center level redundancy, you've got alternate AB power grid, you've got cable ingress and opposite, opposite sides of the building. But, okay, that's fine. But, you know, even in your office, you can have multiple IP providers coming into multiple IPTL boxes over multiple Ethernet ports over cable to multiple redundant switches. Now you're protecting everything from the remote user through all the networks all the way to your internal network. We don't just stop at the edge, but we actually take you into your network. And so this is a way of you're protecting the access beyond the internet, but through the ethernet port, a bad cable, and even at the redundant switch level. One of our unique features is the ability to run multiple simultaneous tunnels and pick the one that works the best. This is called bonded tunnel failover. It is a active hot standby. Um, the way the internet works is you actually don't have any control over the path your data goes. So packets can go one way, one time, and another way on the next packet. And those who know me, I'm, I'm a big one for actual demonstrations. And this screenshot is actually from my unit, from my hotel room when I was in Dubai Media City earlier this year. Connected up to actually the hotel Wi-Fi. I was logged into the captive portal using our hotel app. I've got multiple tunnels coming back to my office making sure I've got connectivity and that I can be productive while I'm on the road. Um, if there's intermediate filtering, if there was blocks, they would automatically switch to different tunnels and I wouldn't even know what's going on. My apps wouldn't know and everything would stay up. And this is how I stay online. This is a quality of life issue, right? I'm able to talk back to the office. There's an eight hour time difference. I can talk back to the office in the evening, get caught up, I can do my work and get quotes out, um, talk to my family. Um, and I'm assured of having that connectivity back to, um, to my home base. Here's a typical example of connecting two multiple independent ISPs with two different tunnels. We've got our appliance, two different ISPs, and we can connect them up to our interfaces and, and provide failover and, and bonding on that. Or if you need to protect against the hardware, we can provide multiple hardware devices with the multiple ISPs. Um, very flexible to adapt to the situation that you need. Here we have standby tunnels going to the server. So on the basic no frills tunnel, it was one tunnel, it rolled over, it wasn't, it was uh, active passive. Well here is where you have an active hot standby. So you know all the tunnels are up and that the failover is ready. And so we've got clients going to each of the different servers. And if one server goes out, it'll just fail over to the next. And when it comes back up or gets replaced, it'll go back to the primary server. And you can actually stack up multiple servers like this as well and deal with load balancing and, and deal with larger scale as you grow. And one thing you can notice is you actually don't have to have multiple internet gateways. Now that is a point of failure, but that is for you to determine or your customer to determine. 
but we can provide that redundancy supporting multiple locations even if you've got a single interface. Um, we can do that all logically with multiple tunnels. Here you have two appliances protecting against hardware failure like power supplies, CPU, bad Ethernet ports using VRRP. And what's interesting is, is that we can actually provide protection on both the uplink side as well as the LAN side at the same time. There are some applications, they're called inline, where you want the IPTL tunnel to be in line with the rest of the gateway. Let's say you're going to enclave or separate the rest of the, uh, the network so that there's some extra security and protections. Um, and the question comes up is, is what happens if the IPTL dies, right? In other words, a single point of failure. Well, we can eliminate that by stacking our boxes up, and they work together in conjunction. And if one box dies, the other picks right up, and maybe there's a blip, but the data still flows. Now, usually redundancy and failover protection is organized for physical central site. Everything gets aggregated to one location. But we're seeing a move in the market where you've got multiple locations. You have disaster recovery uh, sites. You have multiple headquarters. So here we have an example of redundancy between diverse physical sites. In fact, actually in two different countries, one Switzerland and one in the U.S. Um, this is actually a large VoIP customer of ours, UC customer, and they need to make sure their endpoints register with their switch. And so they primarily go out their Switzerland uh, connection. But if that somehow becomes unavailable for some reason, server dies, network goes down, the data center is offline, everything then will switch over to the U.S. site. The endpoints don't see anything different. They're still online, they're talking to the switch, everything's good. And then when the Switzerland site comes back on, everything will fall right back over. So remember this guy? So this is the pretty extreme case for a redundancy. But again, in their business analysis, in risk analysis, it indicated that they needed to make sure that those remote links were up all the time. The cost of downtime, you know, think financial and banking, it's got to be up. So this actual customer, here's what they use. They actually use most of our features in this. You have to have remote hardware failure protection. You have to have central site hardware failure protection. They've got multiple redundant tunnels. They have tunnel obfuscation with the black noise. Um, and they have failover and meshing from not only the headquarters, but also to their DR site. So remember that scenario I talked about earlier where the data replication worked great for that one customer. And when their, when their head end went down, nobody could get to their data replication site. Well, now everybody's got a direct connection to that data replication site. And what's even more interesting is, is let's say that these links, which are on our different provider path, are still up, but this goes down, these units can still get to the re DR site through the headquarters. So this is the magic of routing and magic of, uh, of multiple tunnels where we can fully mesh all of this together. And oh, by the way, they have about 17 different subnets that are all sloshing around on this network uh, to, that all the different sites need to be able to get to. So we've really covered a lot of information uh, but let me recap a couple of the benefits of what we do. Uh, we use the latest tunnel technology and security. We integrate that to work with dynamic IP on both ends of the link. We put in the tunnel protections, removing those fingerprints and traffic analysis capabilities with our black noise, bonding tunnels for failover and bandwidth aggregation, and of course, our system monitor, uh, software-defined failover switching. And all of these features are standard, no recurring license. They're in your standard software today. And remember, when the IT manager is happy, everybody is happy. So thank you for listening to this presentation. Of course, if you've got any questions, please reach out to me at scott at iptechlabs.com. I'm happy to discuss any scenarios. Also, we have a monthly tech talk, which is a technical training seminar. It's online. It's a three-part, three-day series that's free and open to anyone. You can go to the link here at the bottom of the page and uh, sign up for the next one. Um, and we would love to have you. Thank you very much.